Welcome to The Art of Modern Ops, a podcast series on modernizing cloud infrastructure. Hosted by Cornelia Davis, WeWork CTO and author of the book, Cloud Native Patterns. Through a series of interviews with both visionaries and practitioners, she discusses hands-on use cases with those who've completed the digital transformation and others still in transition. Learn what cloud native technology looks like and what you need to make the shift to cloud native. Download the six reasons to start the cloud native transformation white paper at weave.works forward slash resources. Hello, today on the show, we are joined by Cody Hill. Cody Hill is the field CTO at Packet. Prior to that, he worked at another vendor. And before that, he worked at GE. So he wasn't always at a vendor. He was a a user or, um, you know, a a consumer at that point, which I think we'll we'll probably touch upon that a little bit. Um, Cody, thank you so much for being on the show. Welcome. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. So that's a pretty brief introduction from my part. I'd love to have you start out by telling us a little bit more about yourself and your background, please. Yeah. Um, yeah. So like you mentioned, I was uh, at General Electric and that was quite a few years ago. I, I was the lead cloud architect there and built um, a pretty large uh, VMware private cloud for uh, GE spread across uh, America, Asia and Europe. Um, and I think we had about 4,000 hosts underneath it and uh, upwards of 10,000 virtual machines. So pretty, pretty massive cloud there. Um, and then after that, I decided to join an open source SaaS startup that focused in the cloud space, OpenStack and Kubernetes. Um, and I decided to test the waters in sales, pre-sales engineering, and uh, became uh, the leader of the SE team there. Uh, and eventually uh, went to back at house and ran their actual SaaS cloud and as the director of technology. I, I built the uh, SaaS infrastructure on top of Packet. And... Um, uh, so I've been a pack, uh, a customer of Packet since 2015, um, and I decided to go ahead and join them last year, uh, and uh, as field CTO. So been an employee of Packet uh, for a little bit of time now, and it's it's been great. Oh, that's great. Now, of course, Packet has had some exciting stuff happening recently. Um, I think very recently, you the acquisition closed, the acquisition by Equinix closed. How how's that going? Yeah, so we, we closed the acquisition with Equinix. Um, it's great. Uh, Equinix is a great company. Our our goals and visions are, are really aligned about uh, kind of playing in the, in the neutral space inside of uh, infrastructure, right? So um, it's a great co- company to partner with. And uh, we were already a, an Equ- Equinix customer by being in a lot of their locations. Um, so now it's a pretty good marriage, just kind of, you know, taking Equinix up the stack a little bit and, and pr- providing bare metal to their customers as well. So we're super excited about that. Oh, fantastic. Congratulations on that. Um, all right. So what I wanted, the place that I wanted to start was I wanted to start with this concept of specialization. You know, I, I've been in the industry for a long time and Back in the day, IT was all about specialization. So when an application was needed, um, the teams would go out and do an analysis and they would figure out exactly what they needed to be able to solve that problem in a very bespoke way. And they would go to IT and they would say, here's my bill of materials. Here's the things that I need. And IT would, you know, pull things together and provide that infrastructure or provide that middleware or whatever the case may be. Um, But then recently, IT has kind of moved, you know, in the last, I would say, decade or so, certainly with the cloud, it's moved more towards a kind of homogeneous, kind of a commoditized infrastructure and more of a, you know, consume, everybody consumes from a menu of, of, of fixed things. And with things like Mark Andreessen's landmark piece in 2011, he really talked about software being the differentiator. And sure, maybe some of the operations around that software is a differentiator, but we really have moved to this kind of commoditization of IT infrastructure. But Packet makes this very provocative statement of 
make infrastructure your competitive advantage, which is kind of very different from the way that a lot of us have been positioning things in the last five or 10 years. So I'm very curious to hear a little bit more about that. Yeah, um, absolutely. So when, when Packet got started, it, it, they, you know, basically were looking at the, the landscape and realized that um, they have all these public clouds basically putting out, you know, cookie cutter um, and, and kind of T-shirt size, small, medium, and large uh, virtual machines, mostly, right? And um, not all of those fit everybody's needs, um, you know, the best. And what happens if you need an ARM processor, for instance, right? You have a workload that that works really well on top of ARM. Um, you couldn't get that from any of the public clouds. And I think up until six months ago, uh, you, yeah, that was still true. Um, what happens if uh, the latest GPU really helps with your AI analytics workload and, and you know, sequencing genes and stuff like that? Um, what do you do with the public cloud? And and the answer was, well, I can't run that workload there. I need to find a, another place to to run that workload. And so you had to go acquire data center space and acquire networking and rack and stack servers and get that server built and all of the things that uh, you t take for granted. And, and quite frankly, we're losing that skill set in the market today of the, of the amount of people that know how to do that because the cloud fits that need so well um, in the large larger commodity space, right? So um, what Packet said is, look, we, we can actually take it down to delivering bare metal compute and give everyone that cloud experience. You get a server in less than 60 seconds. Um, you can then put any type of software on top of it that you like um, and get that cloud experience of a virtual machine, but yet it's bare metal. And then swapping out those components inside of it um, will take a little bit longer, but you can get exactly what you need. And so, so that's really what we mean by the, the competitive advantage. If you need a certain processor or a certain add-on card or a, a certain GPU or a mix of CPU and RAM that makes absolutely no sense for any other workload but yours, um, you can get that at Packet. Interesting. So you must have a pretty rich catalog then of these various hardware configurations. Is it that you just simply have a very broad matrix of these things that you can put together very quickly? Well, um, Packet itself is standardized on um, the type of infrastructure that we provide to what we call our public cloud. Right, so our public cloud is in seven locations, uh, and we have about 15 different server types that you can pick from in those seven locations that fit 90% of use cases. Right, um, so if you need to be in a certain geographic location and you want access to the fastest uh, machine, you're going to go with a bare metal machine, right? And it's you're just getting it's going to be faster than a VM, and that fits for about 90% of our customers. Then that other 10% of customers, which makes up a, a, a large portion of our our business, um, are the, the customization folks, and um, most of those people can uh, utilize the base of one of our 15 configs, right? They, they'll say that our M type server that has a lot of RAM is a good base to start with, but we need to add a GPU to that or we need to increase the RAM or increase the processor count. Um, or they might choose one of our existing ARM systems, which we were one of the only places that was a cloud to get ARM processors for the last few years. Um, and they might choose that and increase the NIC to a 100 gig NIC versus a 10 gig NIC or something like that. Um, so it's a lot of customization uh, for individual customers of one of our base SKUs. Um, so we might need to order extra processors or more memory modules or specific GPUs or NICs. Um, but as far as the main board and chassis goes, those are pretty much uniform across our fleet. Uh, that is so interesting. Very fascinating. So coming back to your earlier point, so you were talking really about specializations for various use cases. And so, of course, one of those use cases, or perhaps it's just a category of use cases, is that of edge computing. Now, you talked about the different data centers that you have available, but let's uh, let's spend a little bit of time talking a little bit about what hardware looks like at the edge. Yeah, so that's uh, a very interesting topic. And uh, when we get into the edge, we have to... Uh, ask the question is, what does the edge mean to you? Um, and so what the edge means to packet is bringing the compute as close to the data as possible, as low latent to the data as possible. 
Um, and to some people, that means actually putting the device in the car, right? Or putting that device on the, the manufacturing floor. Um, and to pack it, we're, we're still utilizing warehouses, um, or sorry, data centers. So um, putting that uh, device inside of the uh, geographical location that you need it, um, you know, if you need to be in Chicago or you need to be somewhere in Alabama, right? That's, that's it. for some reason, that's important to you. And we want to get that compute in that location. So a prime example of this is our customer Sprint. Uh, Sprint decided to roll out their new 5G uh, Curiosity network, and they have the manpower and the know-how to go stand up new data centers and new network locations all across the U.S., but they, they saw the value in packet that we were able to, they, they were able to put their finger on a map and say, we want to be in this geographic location with our new 5G network, and packet would do all the legwork and get them to where they have a REST API to consume to spin up their hardware um, in that location in less than three months, and because that's what we do best is open up new new locations and set up that infrastructure and put a REST API in front of it. That's not Sprint's core business. And so we, we do that piece better than anybody else. So they decided to partner with us rather than do it themselves. So we're running a lot of edge locations for Sprint to roll out this Curiosity network, which that network has gravity to it, right? We have other customers such as uh, high-tech gaming customers that are wanting to then put their compute right next to Sprint's edge network so that uh, customers holding hand, handheld playing games have very low latency to, um, to that game experience, right? So they're writing that Sprint network into a packet facility and connecting to compute in that same location, right? So to us, that, that's what the edge is, is getting as close to the customer as possible. That is just so fascinating. I had no idea of the details of what you're, uh, you know, even the high level that you're talking about there. Um, just this idea of, you know, what you said, you said something to the effect of that's what we do. We know how to stand this stuff up. We know how to stand it up quickly and manage it moving forward. So repeatably and, um, you know, manage it at scale. So I, I imagine that's a big part of it as well. It's not just standing it up, but being able to manage it at scale. Yeah, so we, we have a world-class operations team that has done this before, um, and uh, they're now here at Packet, you know, doing it again for us. And um, they have a supply chain to, to get parts shipped around the world um, to get inside the data center and replace whatever you know pieces might might break before customers notice. Um, and we built an entire software suite around managing a fleet of bare metal servers. There's a lot of things that go into physical infrastructure that folks don't think about, BIOS upgrades, firmware updates, um, all of that stuff, and p making sure that you have the latest firmware and the latest uh, BIOS, and that uh, when a server gets deprovisioned, that you make sure that uh, you wipe the data off of it in a way that's not going to ruin the disks so that a new server gets, uh, a new customer can take that server and not have the other customer's data and it still performs well. So there's, there's a lot of pieces and a lot of moving parts in running a bare metal cloud that we've really streamlined, automated, and put world-class operations around. Yeah, fascinating. So I think I know what the answer to my next question is. So we're, we've been talking about edge here and, um, and so at the edge, is it pretty much bare metal or do you do virtualization as well? Yeah. So, uh, packet does bare metal, but, um, and, and packet provides a either Linux operating system, VMware windows, right? So we're, we're really agnostic to the, the OS or the software that goes on top. Um, and what we're seeing and, and very rarely does is the customer just utilizing a, a Linux operating system for their, uh, deployment. They're either running Kubernetes on top and, and container, containerizing that, um, or they're running some type of open stack to do like NFE workloads in the case of Sprint. Um, or they're utilizing VMware to run their, their application just closer to their customers because they've built that application on top of VMware and that's where it works best. Um, so we really want to be agnostic to that. And what Packet does is we deliver the, a world-class network with great bare metal compute and the operating system of your choice. And where you take it from there is up to you. 
That's really, really interesting. Now, you're starting to bring us over to the topic that I want to move to next, which is, in fact, uh, Kubernetes. But something you said earlier, um, it really kind of uh, made me think about things even on that trajectory a little bit different. So you use the term bring compute to data. Now, that this is not a term of today. This is a term that we've been talking about in the industry for at least 10 years, um, if not more than that. And I would say that probably the first place that that phrase started getting used um, in, you know, at, in mass was during the Hadoop era. So that was one of the big things that Hadoop wanted to do. But um, and Hadoop, I mean, in retrospect, I think that there were definitely people that certainly got business value out of their their investment in Hadoop. But at, at a broad scale, it really hasn't panned out as people expected. And to some extent, I'm going to speculate here a little bit and say, you know, maybe that was because the, it was a very, very specific storage, you know, data storage model, you know, an HDFS, as well as the process model with MapReduce and then various flavors around that. And now what's happening is that Kubernetes actually doesn't bring that opinionation. It doesn't bring a specific programming model or it doesn't bring a specific storage model for your data. Obviously, there's storage, you know, there's the, the way that you connect to your storage devices. But other than that, it is not as opinionated as Hadoop. Um, kind of feels like this is this has more legs to handle more use cases because of that 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 flexibility. Yeah, uh, I, I would definitely agree with that. Um, yeah, as, as you were explaining that, the first thing that came to my my mind of why Hadoop and MapR, um, you know, isn't the big eight hundred pound grill in the room was that opinionation, right? So, um, yeah, and with with Kubernetes, that definitely opens things up and and gives you the world to you can run MapR and Kubernetes now, right? So you still have the the ability to do that, um, but there's so many other things that you can do. You can run TensorFlow. You can do you know anything. You can run your legacy applications if you wanted to, right? There's still very old, you know databases and all of this that you could run on Kubernetes. And so it's kind of becoming a uh, the new Linux, right? It, it's becoming that data center operating system uh, where it's it's almost table stakes to have Kubernetes running in, in a location and then put your application on that uh, back to where it used to just be have Linux running in a location or have Windows running in a location and put my app on top of that. Kubernetes is becoming that standard more and more. Yeah, yeah. And I'm going to come back to that in just a moment. Um, so Kubernetes, of course, lives in the CNCF, um, in the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. And Packet, Packet supports the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, the CNCF, in a pretty big way. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so we're big fans of the CNCF. And uh, the CNCF has been running um, a lot of their uh, applications and programs on top of Packet. Um, and uh, cncf.ci is one of those. Um, and one of the other big things that we're doing is that we've uh, created the CNCF Community Infrastructure Lab, um, which allows um, customers with CNCF projects that need to do CICD or testing or uh, prototyping of their application to get free access to packet compute to do that. Um, you know, we're big fans of Kubernetes and what it allows people to do. And I think that's kind of what brought us into being uh, close partners with the CNCF was that those Kubernetes projects. Um, and yeah, we have a really good relationship there and we'd like to keep that moving forward. Uh, so for me personally, and on, on behalf of Weaveworks and dare I say for the, the whole Cloud Native Computing Foundation um, in, in industry, thank you for that. Um, yeah. Now you mentioned CNCFCI, CNCF.CI, which of course is the dashboard that shows the, the CI status. That it's the you know red red and green dashboard, our test passing, and those types of things for the incubated. Pro I'm sorry, the uh, graduated projects in the CNCF. And so you can go to CNCF.CI today, and you can see whether things are passing or failing, and see that status. And that is all running very clearly. It shows on that dashboard on packet. Now, I have found older versions of the CNCF.ci dashboard that showed those tests running against different infrastructures. 
AWS, GCP, GKE, Azure. So, you know, both, both the infrastructure, you know, compute storage and network, as well as the specific Kubernetes distributions that are by these loud, large cloud service providers. And Packet, of course, had a column alongside those other um, cloud service providers. And so I kind of look at that and say, well, today it's only showing Packet. And I, I, to some extent, speculate that the reason for that is that back to the point you were making a moment ago, Kubernetes is in fact reached that level of maturity where it does act as a real abstraction layer, abstracting away the infrastructure. And when it, by achieving that, it doesn't, it no longer matters what's happening on AWS and Azure and GCP separately because it will be the same across all of those. And therefore, Packet can support it or anybody else could, but it's only on one of those. What do you think? Am I crazy? Is it really providing that level of abstraction of the infrastructure? Yeah, I, I think there's a few things that you need from uh, your, your infrastructure layer to, um, you know, basically allow Kubernetes to be complete, right? So you, you need a, uh, a storage layer uh, beneath it. You need a service type load balancer uh, in front of it. Um, and having a cloud control manager um, to kind of give Kubernetes the knowledge of the underlying infrastructure is important. So um, where Packet does not have a Kubernetes distribution of, of our own, um, and we, we don't plan on ever having our own Kubernetes distribution, uh, we did find it important to invest inside of Kubernetes and, and build those things for our cloud, right? So <clears throat> uh, we've built the uh, CSI driver for uh, Kubernetes to, to our backend block storage. We've built a, a cloud control manager that allows you to um, utilize and see all of the infrastructure from within inside of Kubernetes, what instance types you're using, what availability zones they're in, so on. Um, we've built a, a, a node autoscaler. So if your uh, in infrastructure decides to start uh, growing, um, you can definitely auto scale that horizontally. And then lastly, we've built uh, along with um, some other folks in the community, a service type load balancer that works well on top of packet in metal LB, which is te technically unsupported at the moment. And we're seeing what we can do to fix that. Um, and so once you have all of those components inside of Kubernetes, now one cloud versus the other cloud really doesn't matter because Kubernetes can orchestrate load balancers, it can orchestrate storage, it can spin up new nodes as it needs to. So Kubernetes is Kubernetes. And so running on top of Packet uh, versus Amazon versus Google, um, you get the exact same experience, only you get bare metal with Packet. Yeah, interesting. Okay, so I'm gonna turn us back to the edge a little bit. So we talked earlier about whether there were certain specializations that worked particularly well at the edge. You talked a little bit about the different server types that you have and how it handles 90% of the cases, and then how you work with your customers to specialize for the, that, that last 10%. Um, have you found, and now we've been talking about Kubernetes as the abstraction away, you know, abstracting away the, the details of the infrastructure. Is there a Kubernetes specialization that works quite well at the edge? Yeah, so um, one of the newer distributions that's uh, just kind of emerged over the last few months is K3S. Um, I'm a big fan of K3S. It's really designed uh, to run at the edge. If you look at their, their website, they, they say it's the Kubernetes for the edge. Um, and they've built it in a very compact, distributed way to, distrib uh, to get it up and running. It's still very early inside of uh, in the days of K3S. I would not trust running production on top of it yet. Uh, they have some things they need to work out, but it's very promising. And, and what it allows you to do is install a full Kubernetes uh, control plane and node in something as small as a Raspberry Pi and still have enough compute left over to deploy your applications on top, which has you know, kind of been a problem in the past. And um, with ARM computing being super efficient for, for web-like workloads and, and things like that, and, and a very great price point, having a Kubernetes distribution that supports ARM out of the box is very exciting. And Packet loves the ARM foundation, and we have a lot of ARM servers that, that you can utilize. Um, and then also having that exact same experience work on x86 systems that you might need 
more horsepower in um, and something like that. So I think um, as far as a Kubernetes distribution that does uh, Kubernetes at the edge very well, it's K3S, um, but it, it still has a, a long way to come as far as having all the functionality you'd want to run a lot of clusters and whatnot. Interesting. So now you're making me also think about the software de delivery life cycle. So ultimately, of course, you know, you're saying you're suggesting that maybe not quite ready for production. It will get there at some point. So whatever the Kubernetes configuration is um, in production at the edge, whether it be K3S or something else, you've got that configuration there. Um, but you're not obviously going to do your, your developer um, running on their developer desktop, they're going to want to run and they're going to want to do their development based on a Kubernetes that's running on their laptop. And then there might be some CI CD processes, um, you know, some testing processes that sure, the closer and closer you get to production, the closer and closer you're going to get to the hardware and the configuration. But we were just talking about how Kubernetes actually acts as a pretty good abstraction for that. So that allows us to have this heterogeneity of the different infrastructure that supports the software delivery lifecycle. I mean, that's only one, one use case is to say, okay, there's a place where we might have some heterogeneity across the board. Now, that's, that's this Kubernetes. So we're saying that, you know, you, you said earlier, Kubernetes is Kubernetes at some level. But then there's a whole host of things, you know, Kubernetes, of course, is a it's a tool chest. And when you deploy Kubernetes, sure, you can deploy applications, but there's this this blending, this munging together of kind of user space and system space. And there's plenty of things that are deployed into Kubernetes that you would say actually belong that actually categorize as configurations of Kubernetes or extensions of Kubernetes that might be monitoring or it might be um, some security, you know, daemon sets that you deploy that are not deployed by the application developer, um, but they're actually part of that Kubernetes substrate. So we've got base Kubernetes um, and then we've got some additional things across the top. Um, so we need to manage across this heterogene heterogeneous environment and across um, you know, these additional configurations. Any comments on that? Yeah. Um, so this is where, um, and I think WeaveWorks might have pioneered this, or at least one of the founders is GitOps. Um, and so the, the, the GitOps model, um, we're you know, basically, yeah, you have your way of deploying Kubernetes. And then with Kubernetes, you might need Prometheus and you need um, your Istio ingress controllers and you need, uh, or your Istio service mesh. And maybe you're using uh, a ingress controller like Nginx and um, all of this stuff. And you have it configured in such a way that you have cert manager to manage certificates for you. And you have external DNS configured so that when you create a service uh, or when you create a load balancer, it sets up DNS for you. And there's all of these different components that you haven't touched an application yet, right? Uh, it's, it's all of the different add-ons and widgets that you put onto Kubernetes to make your life a lot easier and make that developer's life a lot easier. And that a developer starts to expect to exist in every Kubernetes cluster that's deployed, but yet that's not just a, it's not just Kubernetes, right? So, um, yeah, that, that's when you, you start getting into having to version control all of your manifests and all of your, um, CRDs inside of Kubernetes so that you can, you know, deploy that same cluster all the time, um, no matter where it is, right? Whether that's more than one packet data center location or across different packet server types um, or across packet and Amazon, right? Uh, so yeah, version controlling that and making sure that you can do all of that, which is the, the GitOps model that WeaveWorks talks about a lot. Yeah, uh, yeah, and thank you. Thank you for bringing that up. I actually wasn't intentionally teeing that up, but you're right. That, that is kind of, that is one of the things that we think works really well is that GitOps for really maintaining the right configurations of Kubernetes, you know, starting with the base Kubernetes and the additional things on top. Of course, we also believe that GitOps is really well applied um, up at the application level as well. Um, so yeah, thank you for, for bringing that up. Um, all right. So as we start to close, I want to turn back a little bit 
to kind of the core competency of Packet. We've been talking about infrastructure and been talking a lot about hardware and bare metal. And um, Packet has been really maniacally focused on infrastructure. Um, and, you know, I, uh, I have a background working for other organizations that were at least very close to more infrastructure providers, maybe not hardware, but, you know, I, I worked for partners of VMware and those types of things. And um, those kinds of organizations are, seem to always want to move up the stack. They want to move up the stack closer to the developer, if you will. Um, but Packet, uh, by contrast, and I talked about the provocative statement earlier about specialization on hardware, I think equally provocative is this idea of that you have stayed exclusively focused on the infrastructure and have intentionally avoided moving up the stack, even when you've had maybe some customers that are trying to pull you up there. So can you tell me a little bit about why that focus and what's what 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 has that brought to you and your customers? I think it's a couple things. I, I think uh, a big part of it is being uh, laser focused on what we do best, right? So why did the likes of Sprint partner with Little Old Packet? Well, we are the very best at opening up new data centers, getting infrastructure in place, getting network connectivity in place, and giving you a REST API to provision, provision that infrastructure anywhere that you want it to go. And so we need to be laser focused on on delivering a very good service there. And uh, so we, we did definitely don't want to, to sprawl and, and try to focus on too many different things at once. We want to be laser focused and be the best in the world at one thing. So that's a part of it. The other part of it is about neutrality. We want our cloud to be looked at as very neutral. You're, you're delivering physical infrastructure with my choice of operating system. There's absolutely no lock-in whatsoever in what we're doing. You can go spin up a server in any data center and put an operating system on it and move your workload. We're trying to not lock you in at all. Um, and, and this then allows the... Uh, all of the partner ecosystem that we have to come and play with Packet uh, and deliver some of the best of breed database solutions, right? So um, we, we have partnerships with Yugabyte and Cockroach, right? They have great scale out database solutions that there's no way that Packet Engineering could keep up with that, those companies and deliver those best of breed database as a service solutions, as well as keep our the, the lights on in our existing business. There's no way that we can deliver a Kubernetes solution as good as WeaveWorks, right? Because that's not what we do best. So focusing on what we do best and enabling our partners and our partner ecosystem to bring the best of breed software stacks for our, all of our customers is, is really a, a passion of ours and what we want to we want to do and, and stay very neutral. And, and Equinix is the cloud neutral place where all of the network connectivity comes together um, for the entire internet, right? And that's kind of what they started back in 1998 is being that neutral location for network connectivity. And Packet really wants to be that neutral location for all of the, the operating systems and then you can, the vendors can come in and provide their application stacks. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Cody, thank you. It has been such a pleasure speaking with you today. Incredibly fascinating conversation. Thank you for taking the time to share your insights and for coming on the show. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Thanks for listening to The Art of Modern Ops with Cornelia Davis. Watch for further episode announcements on the WeaveWorks blog or follow us on Twitter at WeaveWorks.